Today we are joined by Aaron Braswell, uh, who's one of the infrastructure developers here at the Center for Open Science, uh, and Tim Head, uh, who's the developer of the OSF CLI uh, tool and also the head of Wild Tree Technologies. My name is Ian Sullivan. I'm one of the trainers here at the Center for Open Science, uh, and I'll be handling the uh, switching today. So uh, if you want to follow along during the course of this, uh, all of the files for this webinar are available at the following URL. Um, that's just one of our OSF projects that has this particular presentation, uh, a link to Aaron's uh, IPython notebook that she'll be going through in just a little bit, uh, and we'll link the video and other materials there as well. So feel free to open that up and follow along if you want. Uh, it'll also be uh, sent to you um, along with the link to the video when it becomes public. So I work at the Center for Open Science. Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, running out of Charlottesville, Virginia. Our mission is to increase the openness, uh, reproducibility, and integrity of scientific research. Uh, and that's research sort of writ broadly, whatever your field or discipline, uh, we want to make things easier for you. Um, we do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, internally, we're organized into three teams. Uh, we have a meta science team that runs replication studies uh, to try and identify key issues in reproducibility and best practices across multiple fields. Uh, we have a community team. Uh, I'm on the community team. We run events like this and reach out to individual researchers and teams of researchers to try and spread some of those best practices around uh, and showcase some of the efforts that people are making uh, to improve transparency and reproducibility in their research, all of which uh, is made significantly easier and much more possible by our infrastructure team, uh, which is the largest team here at the Center for Open Science. Their mission is to build tools, uh, most specifically the open science framework, that make actually implementing these best practices uh, possible for people in the community uh, and make it as easy as possible for that to happen. So the big effort there is the open science framework. Uh, the open science framework is both freely available and also an open source free software project, uh, the code for which is available online. Um, this is important because this is part of how we see uh, pushing our nonprofit mission is to make both the infrastructure and the actual operation of it freely available. Uh, so in addition to the core software as we run it, uh, we've also built a free API, uh, which is available for other people to interact with it. The OSF is designed to support all of the different stages of the research life cycle from searching for new ideas uh, in the literature to collecting data, uh, interpreting findings, publishing a report. This is a lot of steps. And we know that there are a lot of other tools that are out there that people are using for individual portions of this research life cycle. Uh, and part of our strategic goal with the OSF is to be a way to tie all of these things together uh, so that whatever tools that you're using at different stages along the research lifecycle, the OSF can be the central dashboard for your project uh, and a way to integrate all of those efforts into a coherent whole. Uh, and that means that we are not trying to be better than all of the existing tools that are out there uh, for each stage, uh, and we're not trying to you know, be more GitHub than GitHub, uh, but we do want to give you the option to uh, both have a tool like the OSF that's freely available uh, and connect as many of those other tools as possible to the OSF. And we do that through the API. Uh, the API, just like the Center for Open Science, integrates in a couple of different ways. 
we have uh, applications, add-ons, and user scripts. Um, the OSF uh, is actually an application that makes use of the OSF's API. Uh, the web interface that you see when you go to osf.io, um, portions of it talk to the API directly. Uh, that's the direction of the development. Um, is to make the web interface uh, something that talks to the API directly. Um, there are some other applications out there like JASP, PsychoPy, that are external applications for statistical analysis or experiment uh, operation that talk to the OSF via the API in order to store your scripts uh, or run analyses on your publicly available data. We've also implemented a number of add-ons, uh, which are bridges between the OSF's API and the API for various publicly available uh, web services like GitHub and Zotero and Google Drive. Um, and we have user scripts uh, that you can use uh, or write um, in a couple of different languages. There are uh, libraries for Python and R that have different levels of functionality. Uh, and those are ways of implementing our public API in a uh, language that you might be familiar with in order to make interacting with it easier. Uh, we also have the OSF CLI, uh, which Tim will be talking about a little later in this presentation, which is sort of an amalgam of an application and user script. Uh, it provides a Python library for interacting with the OSF, uh, but it's also a standalone command line client that you can use uh, to um, integrate directly into your sort of experimental workflow without needing to write uh, your own scripts in either of those uh, available languages. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass this over uh, to Aaron Braswell, who's one of our infrastructure developers here, uh, and he'll be presenting the uh, API. All right. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, I'm going to be sharing my screen here with everybody. Um, so uh, as, as Ian said, I'm a developer here at the Center for Open Science. I've been here for just about three years. Um, so I've gotten a chance to see uh, the Center for Open Science grow in uh, both size and also mission. We've gotten to do a lot more cool stuff um, as, I've, as I've been here, which has been great. Um, continuing to expand into those parts of the research life cycle, which has been fun. So um, I'm going to share with you a um, presentation on how just very basics on using the OSF API. Um, and it's going to be in a format called Jupyter Notebook, uh, formerly IPython Notebook. I guess they're expanding beyond uh, just Python, and now their name reflects that they're both Julia and Python. Jupyter, it's like a, anyway, <laughs> I think it's funny. Um, so Julia is another great programming language as well. So um, this is going to be covering some very basic uh, things, starting with just querying the API for publicly available information and then um, moving on to a more fully fledged example, um, which will be creating a project, um, parsing through the information that you get back from the API when you create that project, and then uh, uploading a file to that project. So um, to start off, if you're ever um, interested in reading way more about the OSF API, we have um, a pretty new uh, version of the OSF documentation, API documentation which is available at developer.osf.io. And um, this has a kind of a broad overview of all of the endpoints on the OSF API. Um, there's a lot of information here, so it's good if you're going in with like one specific thing that you would like to know more about. So um, in my uh, presentation, I'm going to be focusing on uh, the nodes endpoint just because um, it's a nice and simple one. So we call a node, it's kind of an overarching name for a project. And so uh, this API documentation will give you an example of all of the different attributes and um, relationships and um, just all the information available on each endpoint. 
as well as an example response that you might get back from the API, just so you know what to expect. So with that, oops, okay, let's go into seeing some of those examples. So we're going to start um, querying the API for some publicly available information. And the first thing we're gonna do is just uh, do some Python imports. Um, and we're gonna define a little helper function that will be, make it easy for us to print out the results we get back from the API. So you can see we're just setting a, uh, our URL as api.osf.io slash v2, which is the URL for the API. And also just a little function to help us print out the results. So uh, as I mentioned before, we're gonna start by accessing the public nodes list. So we're gonna re request the API endpoint for a list of nodes, uh, which is just the term we use for a project. So it's like kind of the container that holds everything in a project. So here we go. So we're gonna, what we're gonna do is um, go to that OSF API URL plus nodes and then see what we get back. And so this response looks a lot like the response that we got back from, uh, that was uh, shown in the API documentation, which is good. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's exactly the same thing as we would get if we actually went to that URL in a, just a normal browser. We have, um, we have documentation also, uh, it's called like a human readable API uh, version. If you just go to it in your browser, you can also just um, see the JSON format, which is good as well, I think. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So if you just want to look at pure data, you can see that as well. But um, if you just go to the URL in your browser, you'll see kind of this human readable printed out format of all the information that's available there. And I am logged in right now, but the great thing about this is you don't have to log in. You don't have to uh, provide any credentials. So it's a good way to just get started um, playing around with the information that you can get back from the API. So this is a lot. So what we're gonna do is just uh, print out just the different sections of the first result that we get back. So we have um, relationships, which is just links to other, um, other more expanded bits of information. We have attributes, which is things like title, description, um, and a lot of like little metadata type things. Um, type, ID, and links, and we'll get to those later. So uh, let's go ahead and look at some of those attributes. So uh, we're gonna go ahead for the first um, results, we're going to print out the titles. So this is live, so I actually don't know what's gonna happen, which is always fun. Hey, those look fine, okay. <laughs> Um, so these are the most recent 10 titles of the public projects that have, were put on the Open Science Framework. So some of them are pretty general, like surveys or materials. Um, we, have a, we have people using it from all over the world, so there are a couple international uh, results as well. Um, it looks like Open Science Community Research is on there too, so I don't know if that's one of, the OS, one of our the, uh, Center for Open Sciences projects, but that's... One thing I like is that we tend to use our own products as well, which is kind of nice so that we can uh, kind of also uh, function as a bit of quality assurance. So if one of us has something we'd like to use, then we can um, get that through the process quicker. Um, and so we can also uh, filter these results. So if we're interested in um, narrowing down our results a little bit, there's a whole bunch of different filters that you can use. Um, we're gonna use the tags filter right now, but if I go back to the documentation, um, there's a list here of all of the different terms that you can filter by. So you can filter by title, category, description, um, whether or not it's public, the tags that we're using, uh, the date created, date modified, um, and then a couple other things. So let's go ahead and um, add to that. We're going to filter by the tag climate and then see what kind of results we get. So this is just printing out the title of the um, result that we get and then a couple of the tags that are associated with that result so we can just uh, verify that that's what we're getting. So yeah, these look like they're related to climate and um, you can see climate is in the tags there as we go along. So um, you might have noticed that uh, we only get 10 results at a time, but there are way more than that, uh, especially for um, if we just do a general node search. Um, so the way, there are two ways that you can expand 
uh, the number of results you get back. Number one is you can just paginate through the results. Um, you can, there's links provided at the bottom of every results page that will let you uh, paginate. Um, so let's go ahead and do that first. So we're going to search now for uh, any title that has the word fish in it. Uh, so the first thing we will do is take a look at that links section. So this will print out the link section. And so you can see that there's a link for the next page, which already includes that filter for you, so you can keep your results going. Also gives you uh, the number of results it returns per page, and then the total number of results that you have. And um, so the next, this goes ahead and also just queries for the next page. So you can see this is what the link section from the next page looks like. It has the next URL, which is looking for page three. Um, there's 10 results, there's 40, but it also has, now it has a link for the previous page, which is the one we were just on. The other option for getting more results would be to add the page size parameter to the query. Um, so this time we're gonna search for anything that has science in the title, and we're going to request 30 results at a time. And then we'll take a look at that links results. Um, so you can see it says total is 724 and per page we have 30. So now we can go through bigger chunks at a time. And the maximum number of results available to request at a time um, through our API is 100. So if you do anything over size 100, it'll just still give you back 100 results at a time. So um, I mentioned before that one of the results included with each individual node or project is relationships. So um, you might notice that if one thing you might notice when you're going through our API is there's a lot of, you get a lot of um, links to other places in the, in, the, um, in the documentation where you can expand on that information. And all of this is, it's mostly conformed to what's called um, JSON API. And um, it might look a little bit strange because there's just, you know, you'd see contributors and you would expect a list of contributors, but instead it leads you on to another uh, URL to follow to get more information about that. So um, it is mostly conformed to JSON API, which is a nice uh, kind of template to start from. And it's a common, a common, uh, common format that's used so that folks who are familiar with this format can just kind of know what to expect and it's easier to um, share this convention rather than just inventing something. So we wanted to go with a community standard for our structure of our API. So going back to relationships, so um, what we're gonna do is take a look at um, the results, the first results, and then take a look at the contributors relationship and then um, follow that contributor's relationship and then print out what, what we see there. So the first thing we did was print out the uh, contributor's relationship and we can see that it is a um, JSON object with links related in an href. And that href there is the uh, URL we can follow to get the more information about the contributors on this particular node. And so then we'll go ahead and follow that, that relationship and see the kinds of information that we have. Um, so we have, this is about one particular person. And so we see that um, we can get a list of their nodes. Um, we can get a list of the institutions that they belong to. We can get some attributes about them. So their uh, first name, this one's for David Meller, who's also a, uh, he works in the meta-science part of the uh, Center for Open Science. And just the information that he's provided here, so um, GitHub, GitHub username, um, links to various other uh, online presences, um, and then also a link to uh, just this page, the self link, which is just a link back to the more information about this particular person. So there's the relationships and a little bit about why things seem to be a little bit really nested. It's because it's following this JSON API standard. Is that it? Yes, okay, great. So now we're gonna walk through um, a more, slightly more complicated example. This would be um, creating a project 
and then uploading a file to that project uh, using the API. So the first thing uh, you'll need to do is create an API token. Um, and you'll do that by visiting your settings page on the OSF. And then uh, on the right hand side, let's see if I'm left. Yes, okay, on the right hand side, there'll be a um, personal access tokens, the left hand side, personal access token section, and you can go ahead and create a new token, and then um, tell it what kinds of permissions you would want. So uh, you would do like full read and full write, uh, probably for this. Um, we'll go ahead and discard one, because I have that already. So, um, now we'll move on. So this is where I'm going to uh, define my token and also the API URL I'm going to be using. So um, I'm gonna be using the staging OSF API. Uh, the links on the um, tutorial that are on GitHub are to the main API. So these examples are making a private project, but if you change the parameter to be public, then just be aware that anything you make using this um, example that you find on the GitHub page will make a public project. So just uh, keep it private if you're just testing out, or if you don't mind, that's fine too. <laughs> so um, this is setting your, your API token and also what URL you would like to make requests to. So I'm also going to just, just to make the code a little bit cleaner, I'm going to define a few helper functions. One is um, to make a post request for us. So it's going to just format the headers of the request in the way that we'd want, including um, content type and authorization, which has the word bearer and then our token in it. That can be kind of a kind of tricky sometimes um, when trying to make authorized requests to the API. So this is just so we don't have to write all that again, which is nice. It'll just post our uh, post our data for us using that helper function. And then we'll also do something really similar for a GET request. Not that we actually need um, to authorize a GET request, but it's nice if, we're, if we authorize our request, then we can get back our private projects as well, which is something we might be interested in. Um, and then also just a put, re put uh, request helper, which is for put requests are used for like updating a specific, um, specific endpoint usually. So very similar things, just slightly different methods formatting our um, headers with our OSF tokens. So now we're going to um, define a Python dictionary with um, the data that we'd like uh, to use for the node that we're going to create. So um, we're creating a node, so it has to be type nodes, and then these are just some um, attributes of the node that we're going to do. So we'll do test project for webinar. That'll be our title. And uh, this is a test node created as an example. We can just keep it at that. Perfect. And uh, it's public, it's not public, so it's private, public, false, and it's a project. So we'll go ahead and uh, save that particular dictionary as our node data. And then we're going to go ahead and use our predetermined helper function to post that request and then um, print out the information that we get back. I don't think we need that. Okay. <laughs> print out what we get back. So um, it looks a lot like the data that we saw before. So when you post, when you post to a node, um, when you post to um, the nodes endpoint to create a new node, it will give you back um, exactly what it created. So it gives you back that um, node information with all of the, uh, gives you back that full node detail view of, of the node that you just created. So we can actually use that um, node response to follow the files relationship and then get that files link um, in that files relationship. So I can show you if we go to the node list and we look for 
watch this. Files. <laughs> there we go. It's the first one. Um, the files relationship. So this is the link that we're going to find on that node that we just created. And um, so this files thing, files link leads you to this node providers list. And um, as Ian mentioned before, we um, actually connect to a bunch of different storage add-ons and OSF storage is um, one that's included on every single uh, node by default. But in this list of the providers, you'll also see if you have GitHub or Dropbox or Google Drive, those um, will appear right here along with OSF storage in this link, in this list of uh, file storage providers. We've got one question here. Uh, Philip asks, what is the difference between the normal API and the staging API? Oh, so the staging API is just um, where we are constantly adding new features and testing things and it can go down a lot and it can be unstable. So it's just basically a uh, internal test environment um, for our QA to use um, before we release a feature out to the to the uh, production stable version of the OSF. So that's all it is. It's just kind of a a place um, where we can test things before releasing them. And since I'm just creating a bunch of example projects, I'm just um, adding them to staging so that I'm not cluttering up my uh, my real OSF account. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and, ooh, that's what that other line was for. <laughs> I was like, why did I, why did I comment that out? Okay, that makes sense, I shouldn't have commented that. All right, take two, try that again. So now this is the uh, response that we'll get um, when we follow that file link uh, relationship. Very similar to the list of providers over here. So um, we're going to go through that response and find the upload link, um, which is what we found here. And that's what we're going to use. So we're going to create a really simple text file um, that just is just text. <laughs> um, and we're going to use our put request predetermined uh, helper function to um, use, uh, we post that file data in JSON along with um, the upload link and information about that it's a file and that give it a name. Newest, we'll call it newest cool file. Just to show you it's live. Okay, and then we're going to uh, put, put to that upload link and then get the information back. So, um, we got the information about the file that we just created. Uh, so it's a cool file. And this is just a whole bunch of information about that particular file, um, including its size. And one other cool thing is we also include hashes. So SHA-256 and MD5, just so you can verify that your file is okay and it's good and it's good condition. Um, all right, so now the last thing we should do is go visit our file on the OSF. So if we go ahead and look, uh, we can visit, this is just visiting the project that we just created and seeing the file. And woo, this is one part of fun part about staging is sometimes it can look really weird. So as in right now, <laughs> it looks really weird. But you can see uh, my misspelled title here for our project and if this was working, which maybe uh, shouldn't have used staging for this particular thing, we would be able to see our files here on the OSF project that we just created. So yes, that is um, a super basic example on getting started with the OSF API. As Ian mentioned, um, the, this GitHub repository is connected to the um, OSF project and um, it also includes installations, uh, instructions for installing um, some requirements that this notebook used if you're interested in um, running it yourself. All right, thanks very much for uh, running us through that, Aaron. Uh, I'm just gonna transition back over now. Uh, so next up, uh, we are joined by Tim Head, who's the developer of the OSF CLI uh, and head of Wild Tree Technologies.
and he'll be walking you through what's possible with the OSF CLI tool. Hi, so I'll try and talk and share my screen simultaneously, which hopefully will work. Yeah, so I will talk a little bit about a piece of software we built that is called uh, OSF CLI, or these days more OSF client. And it is a tool, or it, it's two things. It's simultaneously a command line client and a Python library for interacting with the OSF. So um, I'll talk about that kind of, you know, maybe not schizophrenic uh, setup, but that split personality a little bit. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, then please do ask them and write them not into the chat, but into the, the Q&A uh, thing. Um, and then I will try and answer them either while I'm talking or uh, at the very end. Okay, how did I get started um, with this or how did I get involved with OSF? So back in a, a previous life, I was a researcher at CERN, which is a particle physics research lab here in Europe. And now I work with um, various uh, companies and universities. And some of them are genomics people and they have a lot of files that they would like to share. And adding or downloading more than a few files by hand from osf.io is a bit tedious. Um, so that, you know, the question was, can we build something with which we can just type one command and it will fetch all the files or send all the files? And that was one of the, the first ideas behind trying to build a command line client for, for the OSF. And then, yes, especially in, in particle physics or in genomics, you very quickly have very big files. And then um, you don't re you know, if you have a file that's several gigabytes large, uploading or downloading it through your browser is um, oh, you know, it's just a bit tedious. So that's where we've come from. And you will see if you look at um, the OSF CLI that is very focused on, on sending and fetching files and it doesn't do very much of all, of all the other things that you can do with the OSF and this is basically because of where we've come from. We've actually got uh, one question about that. Uh, using the yeah. API, what's the file upload size limit? Um, if you or Aaron want to I think it's five gigabytes per file. That sounds about um, right. Um, I'm not. I'm not actually sure. Uh, yeah. That's the uh, upload limit through the website as well. So I would be surprised if it were different. Yeah. So uh, OSF CLI itself doesn't impose any limits. Um, so whatever limit is built into OSF is the limit. <laughs> Uh, ba, ba, ba. Yeah, so the other, the, one of the cool things, if you ask me, about using OSF um, is that you can access the storage provided by OSF, but you can also connect your GitHub project and Figshare and Google Drive and S3 and I think Rackspace and lots of other kind of storage backends. And if that's what you're using in your research, usually when you work together with other people, you find out that they're using something else. Um, and then, you know, <clears throat> having to deal with the API of GitHub and the API of Figshare and the API of Dropbox becomes very difficult if you want to automate things. And the cool thing about the OSF is you can connect them all to your project um, you know, you can connect your Dropbox and your collaborators, Google Drive, and uh, your students, GitHub, and access them all through the OSF. And the OSF takes care of all the, all the difficulty or fiddle 
fiddly things um, related to to all these projects having uh, all these storage backends having slightly different um, APIs. Um, right now, OSF CLI supports these four backends, and mostly it's a question of somebody wanting to use another one and adding usually one line of extra code and then trying it out. Um, so if your favorite one is missing, the slides when we upload them, <coughs> we'll have a link to an issue we use to track which ones already work and uh, which ones are still missing. And you can find instructions on how to make your favorite one work. Um, yeah, and it works with public and private projects, so you can already use it before you want to make everything um, public, which is nice. So to install it, all you should have to do is type pip install OSF client. Um, so it's a Python library, and pip is the package manager that most people uh, are familiar with when they use Python. And so I'm not brave enough to do things uh, live. So I recorded a, a little GIF. So if you just type pip install OSF client, uh, it will download the few dependencies that it has. And after that, you can then type OSF, which is the name of the command line interface, and then dash H, and it will print out a little help message like we just saw there. I'll let it go by once more. Yeah, so if you if you try it out, one good way to find out whether it's at least basically, the basics are working is to type OSF dash H after you've installed it, um, and it should print out that little help message there. And it should work with Python 2 and Python 3. Um, as far as I know, there's no reason why it shouldn't work with Python 2 anymore. <clears throat> so for all the examples that um, come in the, the further slides, I created a project on the OSF. So the important thing, or one thing you will have to look for when you create your own project or want to use it with your own project is the combination of letters and uh, it can also be digits at the end of the uh, URL. So in this case, it's edzfp, and that is the project ID. And that's a little piece of information you're going to need to tell the OSF CLI how to, or which project it should be talking to. So in this project, when I created it, I also, so what you see here is a, a overview of all the files in the project. And in the OSF storage, there's one image. And then I also connected a GitHub repository to it, which contains one file, which is just a, a readme. So with this, we can, I can show you that it works both with the built-in OSF storage and with uh, one external storage provider, in this case, GitHub. So to download a project or what we call a clone, uh, an existing project, you use um, OSF space clone as the command. So I'll wait for the, the GIF to reset. Um, and basically what you tell it is the, the ID of the project that you want to uh, clone. And then it will create a directory with the ID of the project as the name. So you saw just now it uh, downloaded the files, then it created a directory called edzfp. And within that you see two subdirectories called um, GitHub and OSF storage. And yeah, so at the beginning of the GIF now, just shows you that if you type OSF clone dash H because you don't remember how to use it, and it will give you a little help message. And now 
we see again, so you type OSF dash dash project and you give the ID and clone and then it will download all the files from all the different storage backends. So if you now do uh, a listing of the directory, you see there's a new subdirectory and inside it, there are two subdirectories, one for the OSF storage and one for the GitHub storage. And if you look inside them, you will see that it contains the image and the readme that um, we had on GitHub. Okay, so how about adding a new file? Um, for that, we have a command called upload. And here at the beginning, I just show you again, or change into the directories that um, were created when I cloned the project and make a copy of a, pic a copy of picture into the OSF storage directory. So now there's two, and I do OSF-P and give again the project ID upload, and then I tell it the name of the file locally and the name that I would like to give to the file um, when it is on the OSF project. So one thing that you notice is that to upload a file, even to a public project, I need to give uh, my username and my password to do that. So um, to, to tell OSF what username to use, there's a dash u uh, command option. So again, we have added a second picture, and then we do OSF dash p, the name of the project, upload the file, and it will say, Okay, no, you need to provide your username and your password. And to do that, you do dash u, which is what I'm doing now. And you give the username that you use to log into the OSF. And then it will um, ask you for your password and it will upload the file if you type in the correct password. So we've got a quick question here. Uh, do these same commands work with components? Um, I'm not sure what a component is. Uh, so like a component within a project, uh, if you have uh, multiple... Like Subdirectories within... Yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, if you're looking at the OSF page on the right-hand side, you can add components, and those are places where you can attach additional um, add-ons uh, or sort of just logically organize your project. Those are also nodes uh, in the API sense. Okay, then it should probably work. From the fact that I had to ask you what a component is, you see at what level I've been or the guys I work together with use the OSF. Um, we mostly use it to add to different storage backends. Um, yeah. But in principle, if it's a node, then it should work. Um, but if it doesn't, then create an issue on the GitHub repository that I'll um, have a link to at the very end. And, um, you know, somebody can add it or you can add it yourself. Um, yeah. Okay, so now if you go to the lead that uh, we added the second file um, to the OSF storage part. And so one thing that might get a bit tedious is having to type in the project ID every time, um, and as well as typing in your, your username every time. So in this case, what the, the GIF does is use OSF list to try and list all the files in the project. Um, and you see you have to specify the project. Um, but if you get bored of doing that, you can type OSF in it, and it will ask you for the username and uh, the project ID, and it will store it in a hidden file in that directory. And from then on, you won't have to provide that on the command line anymore, and you can just do OSF list or OSF upload 
and it will look in the file to fetch um, your username and your um, project that, project ID that's associated with that directory. We've got a, a couple questions here on the same point uh, about authentication. Uh, is there a way to use tokens or some other uh, access mechanism uh, besides having to type the password in for each operation? So right now, you can't use a token. Um, if we go to the next slide, if you get bored of typing in your password, because it will not ask you every time, um, we don't let you store it in the file because I think it's not a good idea to store your password in the clear. Um, so what you can do is you can set the OSF underscore password environment variable to your password. And then uh, together with the configuration file, it will just use um, that to authenticate you. In principle, we can also uh, support tokens, but it's just something that somebody needs to implement. Um, there's no particular reason why it doesn't, doesn't yet work. Other than that, nobody's gotten around to doing that. All right, so yeah, if you uh, set the environment variable to your password, um, then it will not ask you for it again. And the reason we implemented it like this is because very often we use it from inside Docker containers. And then it's very easy to pass in this environment variable from the outside. Um, so that we found very convenient. And just uh, in terms of uh, handling file changes, we've got a question here. Uh, assume that I upload a folder with the OSF client um, and then some files change. Does the client tool upload all of the files again uh, or make use of the hashes to identify change files or how does that work? So um, if somebody uploads a new file, you can um, use OSF fetch to fetch re a remote file to somewhere locally. Um, you could type OSF clone again, and that will overwrite whatever you have locally. Um, so I think that's not a good idea. Um, so you should do OSF fetch, and then you have to unfortunately um, do that for each of the files that you want to fetch remotely. Um, and to upload a file, by default, if you just do OSF upload, a local file and the remote file which already exists, it will refuse to do that. And the way to, to overwrite it is to specify a dash F uh, to you know, dash or dash dash force to overwrite it. So at the moment, it leaves it to you to know whether or not you want to overwrite it or whether you don't want to overwrite it. Um, and the idea is that we don't really want to re implement you know, all the, the conflict handling or conflict resolution uh, logic, which, for example, you find in Git. Um, especially because often it's it's data files and then it's not very we've not found it very useful to look at diffs of the files to try and figure out who's right it usually requires sending an email to somebody and saying i thought we've not you know why has our data changed for example um and that requires some humans talking to each other so that's why currently it's a slightly basic um way of handling potential conflicts other than it should not let you overwrite by just typing a command where you didn't think the remote file existed it will not let you overwrite it um, without you asking to overwrite it okay so i said osf client is both a command line library and a, a python library and that's quite useful. We had one person ask 
already if they can use parts or can use it for building a web application to talk to the OSF. Um, and so the code you see here is every, all the code that is behind the OSF space list command line um, command, which tells you that all of, all of the, the, you know, if you want to implement this yourself in, for example, a web application or so, then creating a list of all the files in all the storages of a project is a few lines of code because you can keep using the, the library um, and you can use it as a library so you don't have to somehow fit within the philosophy of the command line client um, but you can integrate it into your own project we've got a, a couple of great little points um, Sherry has confirmed that yes, indeed, uh, working with components works just as well as with the project ID. So thank you for double checking that, Sherry. Uh, and we have a question from Alex about whether or not there is a package to access the API in R. Uh, there is a package, it's a work in progress. Uh, it's called OSFR, uh, and you can find that on GitHub. Yeah. The person who maintains it seems to be very nice. I, we bumped in at some point uh, and discussed <laughs> building uh, packages in different languages for that. So. Uh, but, 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 yeah, so the, the idea really is to try and uh, build a library that you can use to do stuff to, to projects on the OSF. Um, and Accidentally, we also built a command line interface. That's not quite true, but that's how we try and think about uh, where to put functionality, for example, so that other people can build other things with it. Okay, so OSF uh, CLI is an open source project. So you can find it on GitHub. Um, and on this slightly blurry screenshot, the most important thing, well, number one uh, is the where to find it, which is circled in red. But the other thing which I think is important is uh, the number of people who've contributed. So currently there's nine people who have contributed. Um, and if you ask me, then one of the goals is to try and increase that number and have more people contribute because different people find different things useful and um, if people can come and uh, contribute then we can build something which does you know things that other people need and it's not uh, a big drag on any individual person's time um, yeah yes so we have um, instructions on how to contribute which hopefully uh, explain you know most of uh, how how people work together for this. Um, maybe if you're a GitHub veteran, then it's not so interesting for you. But if you're new to GitHub and Git, then uh, hopefully the, the instructions are at the right level of detail of getting you going, or at least getting you to, to, the, to the point where you uh, ask a question on how to do it. So feel free also to, to ask if you ever need help with any of the technical uh, mumbo jumbo to, we're more than happy to help you okay so yes that is the end of the uh, presentation um, and at the bottom of the slide here there's the, the full link to the github project and that is it so if there's more questions then um, feel free to ask all right thanks so much tim uh, so i'm just going to uh, put up uh, quick thank you slide uh, with all the links uh, both to the files for this project, the API documentation, uh, and again to the uh, OSF CLI uh, available on GitHub. Um, let's see, I think we've hit most of the questions there. Aaron, do you have some information on uh, 
Phil's last question. So to answer number one is we do not yet have a JavaScript wrapper, but that would be cool. Um, we do have some rate limiting. Um, it is, if you're authenticated, it's 10,000 requests a day and unauthenticated is 100 an hour. Um, for files, we don't have specific rate limits, um, but if you're planning on uploading a large number of files, we can totally accommodate that. Um, if you give us a heads up, it'd be really great. Um, token or OAuth are both totally fine, depending on what you're using it for. Um, a token is useful for scripts or for like uh, one-time interactions, but OAuth is way better for web apps. And basic works just fine, but um, is not as ideal. All right, so we've got a couple last questions. Uh, will the API cover the feature to create a DOI for a project in the future? That is a good question. I am not sure about that. It should, it should be very easy to do. All right, so we, uh, we may check into that uh, and let you know in particular. Um, and Felix has mentioned that he will be very slowly working on uh, building a JavaScript wrapper. Uh, so everyone can keep their eyes out for that. Uh, and That's awesome. Add that to the project as it comes in. Yeah, totally. Uh, so I think that's about it, and we're at time. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to send them to us directly uh, via the um, contact at osf.io email address. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us.